Sweet. Uh, I think we're still waiting on our last speaker, but um, I figure we may as well start since uh, it's two minutes past the hour. So welcome, everyone. Um, we're doing another Twitter space, or I don't know, maybe we should call it X space um, nowadays. But the, the topic of today's space is uh, modular chain abstraction. And um, we have a really amazing lineup of guests who have been deep in the space for many, many years and have, I'm sure, a lot of wisdom to share. Um, and the, you know, the high level is that you know, in, a, in a world of modular blockchains with you know, thousands, if not in the future, millions of rollups, we're going to have a lot of complexity to deal with. And um, this idea of chain abstraction is the most promising uh, sort of, I would say, field uh, that that promises to solution uh, to solve this the problems of fragmentation across this you know potentially very large number of of different rollups and chains um, that everyone will be interacting with. So um, that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, why don't we go through a round of introductions from all of our different speakers? Um, whoever wants to kick us off, go for it. I can kick us off. Hey everyone, Amelia, co-founder of Near, and uh, great to be here. Great to dive into the chain abstraction topic. Zaki, Stefan. All right, I'll jump in. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Stefan. So. Why am I here? Um, I was previously founder at Flashbots. I now founded oh, something called Frontier Research. Um, and we are working with a variety of different industry members on the topic of cake. So chain abstraction, key elements, we put together a working group. And the goal is to drive some level of standardizations across the industry on both EVM and non-EVM chains to be able to help create a better cross-chain experience. So excited to be here. Zucky, is your uh, mic working now? Yes. My audio is, is, uh, is unbugged. All right. Uh, I'll just do quickly introduce myself. Uh, Zucky Munyan, co-founder of Sommelier. Uh, I've been, I think like the general theme of my involvement here is I think we have finally gone to a place we're through a variety of different ways blockchains are scalable. Um, after you know ten years of working on blockchains, um, we we have some ways of making you know low fees, high volume use cases happen. Um, but 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 now there's like a bit the, the the remaining technical challenge is how do we make blockchains usable? Um, and I think that there are lots of people that I've been working with for many years who all have different pieces of technology and have built different kinds of things. Uh, with Sommelier, we we tried to build, you know, we've tr we've tried to build a chain abstracted app um, uh, for accessing yield, and I think there's uh, so there, you know, this many chain like I think we, you know, we can have sovereignty, um, we can have utility, we can have DeFi, we can have meme coins, but we can also have usability um, if we just bring the right pieces together, and uh, I think the chain abstraction community is sort of leading the charge on this. So you're saying that we can have our cake and eat it too. That that is the that is the uh, uh, that that is possible with the right uh, MEB optimizations. The cake can both <laughs> exist. The right ingredients. Eaten. Right ingredients. <laughs> awesome. Um, so why don't we start out then with talking about you know what like wh where's the what's the origin of this of this problem of of fragmentation? I mean. Um, this is, you know, as you said, we're, we're entering a world of, of lots of different chains. We finally have scalability solutions that seem to be working. Um, and yet, once now that we've solved scalability, it's led to this other problem, which is fragmentation. So why don't we talk about like the origins of fragmentation and then, um, you know, how chain abstraction uh, is a response to this problem. Let's not all go all at once. I, I can kick <laughs> it off. Um, we, 
as Zach you mentioned, have, you know, I would say like a explosion of solutions, right? That kind of over past five years matured uh, of how do we want to scale blockchain, right? This is, you know, different layer ones. We then had, you know, obviously app chain approach and we have now rollups uh, that introducing kind of, uh, you know, a, a new d dimension of how you can scale blockchains and how you can um, kind of launch new uh, blockchains in kind of way easier way, right? And uh, Celestia have been uh, driving a lot of that as well. And so all that introduced so much block space, introduced ton of address space, but also introduced new wallets, introduced uh, kind of a ton of different tools, a lot of um, kind of applications that function functionally are the same, but live on different chains. And so all of this creates kind of fragmentation and complexity that uh, with kind of new rollup that's launching probably every hour now is just increasing uh, kind of the demand on the user to understand uh, how they're interacting with Web3. Uh, you know, the example is you go to your MetaMask, you know, your drop down of networks you can connect to. Mine probably already is longer than uh, screen, you know, plus I have, you know, Kepler wallet, obviously near wallet, you know, Solana wallet, Bitcoin wallet. And so uh, just navigating all that complexity is becoming very unruly. And so the kind of primary idea here is how do we provide an experience that is more direct to what user really wants, right? Which is, you know, uh, use some cool app, you know, buy uh, a new NFT that just launched or, you know, uh, interact with some other uh, blockchain app and not need to figure out the navigation of the infrastructure, right? Which bridge to go, what gas token to get, how, you know, exactly um, the kind of the route between where your assets are and uh, what you want should be constructed and, you know, what is all the failure cases that can happen between. And so that's really kind of, again, this movement is bringing is, you know, in the modular world, in the app chain world, in world of multiple layer ones that are, you know, gaining massive adoption uh, how do we really build experience that moves all of that in the background and allows users to freely navigate uh, Web3? So I have, a, I have a bit of a special take on this. Um, how did we get here? Um, I joined the Ethereum space in 2017, and I heard stories of what it was like to be in, um, in the Ethereum community before. There used to be this sort of dream that... Um, Every user of Ethereum would run a you know Geth node locally, and then they would download DApps, they would host it on Swarm, um, and they would basically run those apps locally, and they would speak with their local Ethereum node, uh, sign transactions, and propagate them to the network. There would be one chain, one client, and it would be super simple to use. Um, and we get censorship resistance, we get all the good things that we want to get out of blockchains. Um, that is very different than the world that we are in today. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this thing called the Transaction Supply Network, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of hosted pieces, services run by a bunch of different providers that are helping bring transactions on chain. Um, yet the toolkit and the accounts that we use for being able to communicate with every single component of this and do permissioning and all these things have not changed. We're still in the same framework and mindset as we were in, you know, 2014 when the Ethereum protocol was starting to be worked on. I think like one tidbit that's interesting to, to remember is the fact that chain ID was not introduced as like a parameter inside of the Ethereum transaction like signing format until the 2016 DAO hard fork, right? Like before then, there wasn't even the concept of there being multiple different execution environments that a transaction could be routed to. Um, and so we've sort of, as a, as a space, um, with the beauty of the Ethereum community, what it is, grown in like a bunch of diverse directions and sort of organically, but without the ability of having an integrated sort of view of what we want the, the future to, um, to look like. And the users are like feeling this extremely, right? Like if you look at the numbers right now between Ethereum ecosystem and all the different EVMs versus the Solana ecosystem, all the retail users are going to Solana because 
they don't have this fragmented user experience. The like model there was actually designed to work the way that it's working now, as opposed to be designed to work in a complete different architecture to to where we are today. Um, I heard um, I heard it described in, in, in this way, which I thought was was quite powerful description for people who you know are more technically minded. Um, what the Ethereum and like rollup ecosystem is asking users to do today is essentially to run a Kubernetes cluster in their brain and try to like manage scheduling their jobs across all these different execution environments, manage how their state is being done and like manually bridge state from one place to another and like resources, compute resources from one place to another to make sure that they're able to get the jobs that they want to get done. Um, and that's just not tenable. It's just not a place that we can stay as an industry if we want this rollup ecosystem to actually succeed. I kind of want to respond to that, but I want to let, let Zucky chime in too. Uh oh, it looks like Zucky is. Uh, yeah, Zucky is fighting <laughs> with internet and, and spaces at the same well, anyway, time. So, Stefan, I mean, kind of what I'm hearing you say is that, um, you know, the, the like the way that these systems have been designed did not take into consideration that there would be multiple chains in the beginning, but now that we're kind of in, in that situation. Okay. Can um, people hear me? You know, the, I guess the infrastructure yes. hasn't really ad yeah. adapted. Okay, to awesome. To, uh, uh, provide oh, there you are, Zaki. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. My Uh-oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is it just me or are, are other people having trouble hearing Zaki? Yeah, we all having trouble. Yeah, I think Zaki's internet is not cooperative. Oh, geez. One day, um, one day we have a more consistent network. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, anyway, uh, back to what I was um, saying to St Stefan. Um, but the thing, and, and so you know, you, you were saying that um, the the current sort of Ethereum ecosystem was not really designed in a way that um, it is enables uh, like a good user experience in this sort of fragmented um, situation. Uh, but monolithic chains like Solana that can avoid fragmentation do have a good user experience, at least for now. But uh, don't you think that? Fundamentally, I mean, any single, basically, the, the only way to scale blockchains is is to have multiple state machines. You're not, we're never going to have one single world computer that's unified. Like that original vision of Ethereum was never going to work to begin with. Um, so maybe, I guess, what I'm saying is that the sure having a, like a bigger, more performant um, single chain is, is good, but it doesn't solve. It still doesn't. It's not the end game, and doesn't solve like you're always going to run into this problem essentially yeah well i'm not i'm not the scalability guy i think like my my career in the in the in the ethereum space in the blockchain space has like explicitly been to avoid working on scalability and i always like pawned it off to someone else as a, as a problem to solve um so i don't really have an opinion on here i'm just observing where the users are and objectively there's like 10 times more retail users on solana than there is on ethereum and all the evms combined today um, 10 times more retail users and retail volume. Um, and so to me, that's, um, that's the observation that I'm making. And I can only theorize that the reason for that is terrible UX because we have the block space scalability with, with L2s now. Um, and so it's definitely not cost. That, that's well, that's I, fair enough. Go ahead. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can respond maybe, yeah. Like I think, I mean, we, we just had the panel where we discussed this, right? I think any any single block space right will get filled just by by definition because it, it's an auction and so if it's not filled there is a lower price and so people will fill it until there's a high price and so it, it's an equilibrium of uh kind of how valuable is changing that state uh is um and so then you kind of go from there and so generally speaking there's all there's always will be demand for more block space one way or another. And I think, you know, one way or another sharding be that in a single chain or through kind of rollups, parachains, subnets, 
whatever people love to call them, you know, is a way to continue increasing the block space and have the variety and flexibility that developers want to have. Uh, and I mean, that's where we are, right? Market forces clearly show that uh, this is where we're moving. So we, you know, do need to provide kind of a level of abstraction for all the users across all of these experiences. And so that's, yeah, I think like the, the vision of a single, you know, atomic, atomic um, state machine that will, you know, cover all use cases. I, I don't think even Solana, I mean, even people in Solana agree that this is not feasible to have you know, everything running on one state machine. So, so we do have this um, challenge of multi-chain one way or another. And so now how do we, how do we fix that? So we can dig into that. Zaki, maybe your issue is solved. Yes, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm back. You sound good. We're so back. Anyway, give us, tell us your thoughts. Uh, so I think, so the the like core aspect of it is developers of applications today are facing like so like we we've talked a lot about the challenges the users face, but sort of sitting between the like sort of blockchains and the users is a bunch of developers. And those developers are trying to build something um, that users want to engage in. They need to figure out how to onboard people. They need to figure out how to sort of persistently maintain relationships. Um, you know, people have to be able to come back to their app. People have to use their app. And I think like one of the real challenges is, you know, what 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 pieces of infrastructure that have been offered to developers are all very one chain centric. Um, you know, use this. You know, here is this wallet API. Uh, it, it works in one ecosystem with one set of wallets. Um, maybe there's something about bridging and liquidity routing in an ecosystem. Maybe there isn't. Uh, maybe you can. Maybe there are you know ways of moving between sourcing users who have assets on one or two places or one or two centralized exchanges. It's all been a bit very limiting, and I think that there's like now it needs to be a movement, just like the you know. You know, the, the big movements in blockchain that I've been a part of are the, you know, the transition to proof of stake, you know, which allowed us to have this abundance of block space. The, uh, you know, the beginnings of, you know, bridging, native bridging with IBC and native interop. Um, the begin, you know, the modular architecture uh, contributed to all of those. And all of that has been about, okay, we, 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 could, we could provide a basic security framework that developers can build and we can, we can give them an abundance of block space. But now we have to give them the tools and the infrastructure so that they can onboard users um, and that the that users aren't, you know, sort of trapped um, in one, you know, whether they're Bitcoin users, whether they're Ethereum users, whether they're Solana users, whether they're Cosmos users, they actually just can use everything. There shouldn't be a Cosmos user or a Solana user or a Bitcoin user. There's just a user and you can use everything that Web3 has to offer. Totally agree. <laughs> So we've been talking like more more abstractly, but what are the specific, you know, when we're talking about fragmentation, um, what are the actual specific pain points that people feel? Like we've kind of been like mentioning them sort of, but let's like actually enumerate them more specifically, whether they're users or developers. I can take a crack at this. Um, I think probably the main one is just that users have to think about where their state is. Um, I don't think that users want to think about this. And I don't think that like the application developers have the tools to take that away from the users. What users want to think about is what do I want to get done? What's the like desired outcome that I want? Um, and then it should be the job of the application to do whatever it can to get the job done. Um, and then it's the job of the execution environments to settle those things, to make sure that those things take place and can't be reverted, right? Um, and so in order for users to be able to simply express their desired outcome, we need this like entire thing called intents, 
um, and we need some kind of way for expressing in a sort of declarative way what we want um, the output of the interaction to be. And we need secure ways for which those intents get fulfilled um, using some counterparties, using some routing, um, all the components that, um, that have been sort of mentioned. Um, once we have, I think, those primitives and we sort of propagate them, um, then the user can simply say, I want to have XY token uh, in exchange for my ETH slash soul slash near. Um, and then they don't need to worry about where the fulfillment and the execution happens because the application developer is able to make those decisions for the user. Yeah, maybe just to add another example is right now, you know, we're trying to get more users off uh, kind of a pure seed phrase controlled wallets, which are extremely dangerous. People keep copy pasting their seed phrase into the places they shouldn't and to a more smart contract kind of account, abstract, account abstracted wallets. Now, if you imagine you want to do that across, you know, a dozen chains, uh, some of which are have a very different account model, right? You know, you have Bitcoin, you have uh, kind of EVMs, you have near, like that becomes extremely complicated. You have now kind of complexity of different wallet providers, they support different features. Uh, and you now need to figure out how all of those things are kind of working. And if something happens, let's say you do want to rotate your, your private key, uh, you want to add a new device, like you need to do go and do all of this across all of those providers and, and potentially even uh, specific chains. And so the kind of solution here is really have kind of one account that's able to navigate the other chains. And that account is where you're managing all of your access, your social recovery, your uh, you know, 2FA uh, and whatever other security features and kind of usability features you want to have. And then that can propagate across the whole Web3 and you're not uh, pretty much manually need to go and like figure out and fix everything. So, so something that um that we're looking sorry Zaki something that we're actively working on with the um with the cake working group is this account question. Um, several people have tried to build sort of smart contract wallets with account abstraction, and there's always been this huge amount of difficulty in getting these things adopted. Like I worked on some of the first smart contracts that had universal deployments across all the EVMs and allowed for third-party relayers to bring the transactions to the chain and abstract away um, the gas. I worked on that in 2019. And so the technology was already available in 2019 and it's always been available. And there's been like tens, if not hundreds of different teams that have you know, tried to pitch this to VCs to build out the new type of account that's you know, going to be um, account, uh, have full uh, account abstraction and be a smart contract wallet that has all the nice features that everyone wants. Um, but the reality is just they've never picked up in demand and in adoption because I believe there's a coordination problem in getting people to switch from one type of account to another. Um, everyone is sort of tied in to the same JSON RPC API based account definition. Um, that was defined in 2014 um, because everyone else still is. And so it just has a humongous network effects and we are sort of in this inadequate equilibrium where, um, where there isn't a way for people to switch out of it. Um, so what we're trying to do with this, this cake working group is create a shelling point around helping the entire community switch from one inadequate equilibrium to a better equilibrium where you can actually develop those better um, those better um, user experiences. Um, and I firmly believe that the only way to do that is with sort of ecosystem wide, um, alignment. Um, because if we don't do this approach, we will just further fragment, um, the space by developing all kinds of different account models that aren't necessarily compatible with each other. I was just going to say, I think that there's a, a continuity that exists. So there's 
and I think chain abstraction is sort of trying to address all of these problems, which is, or like there are pro there are challenges with the usability of the sort of modern multi-chain ecosystem that are best solved through new account models. There are problems that are best solved by allowing users to delegate some of their usage to agents. So you could have, you know, sommelier can be thought of as like an agent that goes out and earns yield for you. Um, so you don't have to deal. So you could just, you know, keep all of your state on one chain, keep all of your uh, uh, interactions on one chain. But there's these agents who will go out and deal with bridging and, and the intents. And then, you know, there are times where you want to be able to delegate what you want to do to a market because you can very precisely specify exactly what you want. You want to hold, you want to hold this asset on this chain and you want to trade for this, but, and you don't want it any more than this. Uh, you, you know, you don't want it to cost uh, at least this much. Um, you know, those kinds of cases you could delegate out to markets. And so what we want, what, what chain abstraction really needs to enable users to do is to have sort of standardized ways of extending the power of their accounts so that they work the way that they think they should across a multi-chain environment. Um, and something, you know, different things like, you know, you sh a user should not have to bridge their asset. A user should be able to just say, I want to swap, I want to swap this and I want to swap that. And maybe there's some bridging that happens and maybe there's some market makers involved. Um, but that can be all done, abstracted away from the user and the user doesn't need to actually know or see. They can just be like, I have ETH, I want Bitcoin, I have Tether, I want an ordinal, um, uh, I have an ordinal, I want to trade it for a bad kid. Um, you should I think this is do that. This is such a good point and such a subtle one too that people don't realize. Like the cake framework has so many different components, but like really all chain abstraction is is an expressive permissioning layer, right? Like a the icing on the cake, right? That makes the entire cake work is an expressive permissioning layer that allows for users to delegate permissions across all of these different environments. So I'm, I'm hearing kind of, I mean, the, the common theme on all of this is like, we want to abstract away as much complexity from the users as possible. And uh, um, in, in your cake uh, blog post, Stefan, um, you wrote, crypto users knowing which rollup optimism or base they're interacting with is equivalent to web two users knowing which cloud provider, AWS or GCP, they are interacting with. And um, I guess, I bring that up because to me, I think there's truth in that. But then on the flip side of the coin, like if we abstract away too much from the users, like is it, do, do we, there are certain things that the users should know and care about. Like for example, maybe the security or, or like the, the risks or the, the trust assumptions they're making when interacting with these chains. And so how do we, like where's the balance and how do we, for example, you know, when I sign something and saying, hey, you know, make this trade on my behalf or do these things on my behalf, um, you know, how do I know as a user that the, you know, the, 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 the protocols that they're going to interact with are actually secure or have some kind of like, I don't know, base level of, of guarantees that, that I'm, that I feel safe about, like, and, and doesn't the user need to be informed about these, these risks? And so how do we balance between those two things? Well, when you go to like gmail.com, do you like ask yourself, oh, is this using like a secure email protocol behind the scenes? Like, no, you go to gmail.com because it's an application that you trust that's built by a company that you trust. And so you delegate all of the decisions around security to that application. And there's no reason for Web3 to be any different, right? Well, it, the user just... is going to go to applications and like, the applications are going to be able to manage the trust that the user put in them to make sure that they make good decisions about the tools that they use behind the scenes. I mean, even to add, like, this is already happening, right? I don't think there is, you know, a lot of users who are actually reading the smart contract code and, you know, compiling the wallet from source code, uh, making sure it works, right? They kind of trust that wallet will do a lot of the security heavy lifting for them. And then, uh, you know, we see, you know, wallets starting to actually take that more responsibly and, and starting to add additional security features, right? Preventing user from, uh, for example, you know, trading with malicious contracts and, and interacting with other uh, kind of not clear origin uh, websites, etc. So I think like generally 
the responsibility of the user is kind of the as uh, Stefan said, picking a counterparty that uh, they they can trust in, and then uh, figuring out how to delegate the authority over you know set of assets or set of interactions, and then the kind of now from a developer of that, for example, wallet. The thing is, like, if you now need to maintain, you know, access to hundreds of rollups, uh, you know, you need to maintain and figure out how to pay gas fees, etc. On all of this, you know, like that's a lot of work, and that you know, and you can like your maintenance costs gonna like skyrocket. And so, creating a protocol that allows to now the wallet itself to kind of delegate that authority and uh, have very clear, specific security parameters around execution for example of user intent right, that you know it either fails to execute or it executes correctly uh for example for you know doing a trade is extremely important i think one interesting kind of uh just like like idea that uh, i like to mention is right now let's say there's a bonk token or whatever new meme bold token on base right there those tokens kind of security is defined by that chain It's defined by that roll up. And if something happens with that roll up, right, the kind of social consensus or with that chain social consensus, you know, they can revive it, they can roll back, they can restart, you can do all of these things. And this, you know, keeps happening <laughs> now more frequently than, than before. And so you don't what you definitely don't want is bridging it out to maybe even more secure chain like imagine you you send bonk to ethereum but uh you know solana for example rolled back because of whatever reasons now you have inconsistent state right so you do want to actually have the assets where they issued because the security of that asset itself kind of linked to the issuance uh, network and that's one of the kind of you know uh I would say important aspects of chain abstraction is although we abstract the exact routing and, and complexity, we want to keep the assets where they were where they are and just allow user to have a very easy way to you know specify that they want to uh, get something like this without kind of versus current model where user is in a specific chain and now the only way to like make it usable for them is to bring all the assets to that chain and kind of bring everything there and kind of create lots and lots of additional security kind of and uh, kind of um, counterparties that user is not even aware. So I would say kind of the layers here are handling a lot of the security questions so, so that users don't have to. Zaki, do you have any thoughts on this? So I think that, you know, there's a, I think this, this basic idea is, you know, there's repute, like there are people who build user facing services, um, you know, and those people, you know, uh, will hopefully find that, that they have robust economic incentives um, to take care of, you know, trust and safety throughout their ecosystem. And we do see this, right? Like, um, you know, a lot of pressure on security and interop comes from things like asset issuers, like Circle, or um, or like wallets, um, who often who often you know have a lot of questions, exchanges, etc. Um, you know, when they integrate a service, they 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 ask a lot of questions about security, um, and so as you know, these chain abstraction pieces start coming together, and they start getting integrated into you know the MetaMasks and the Trust wallets and the Coinbase wallets. Of the world, I think people they're going to people those in those places. A lot of questions about you know the security of your interop protocol, etc. Um, or you know uh, uh, you know DAOs that are choosing what to get what gets integrated into you know front ends of, of big user facing apps. Um, all of those places are going to be really good places to ask questions about security. Um, and in you know the worst possible place is to give you know. Is to, is to enter into to a scenario where it's instead, you know, you as a user need to figure out which bridge counterparties are safe, um, which, you know, what assets are safe to hold on a DEX, 
Um, and we've just seen, you know, you know, many billions of dollars of user harm um, come from the fact that, you know, users are uh, users don't have an have an easy way of reasoning about all of this. That's a that's a very good point. I mean, I think I mean to me the way that the analogy with like Web two and and Gmail breaks down is just that um, in in blockchain and, and Web three like there could be potentially a lot of money on the line. So I I feel like there's just a little bit more, um, you know, it's more necessary to take security seriously than oh you know I don't know someone saw my email that I didn't want them to see. I think. A lot of people are, are less concerned about that than like, oh, well, you know, a few thousand dollars vanished from my wallet because, you know, I just trusted this, <clears throat> I don't know, this interface that I was using. So I think that there's something along those lines where I, I think it's just slightly not quite, I don't think you can map it one to one per se. Um, and, but anyway, um, I was also thinking um, about how, uh, account or just like chain abstraction interacts with value capture um, in the stack because <clears throat> kind of what I'm hearing is that uh, w whether whether it's the goal or not of chain abstraction, it does seem to sort of commoditize aspects of the infrastructure uh, layer and there therefore makes me think that maybe certain aspects of infrastructure just won't uh, you know actually capture as much value as people might think, um, you know, if they were operating in this worldview where, you know, chains won't be abstracted away from users. Like if, if, if the, if the infrastructure doesn't actually have a, you know, direct relationship to users, then, then <clears throat> why should it, you know, capture, capture value in the first place? So how, how do you guys think about chain attraction impacting value capture? Go ahead, Zeki. So, I think the I think it should be relatively obvious that in the long run, the most valuable part of blockchain are the ones that are closest to the sort of order flow generated by the user. Um, you know, and you could think of so, like you know, the most valuable business in well in Web two was you know Google AdWords. And what is Google AdWords capturing? It's capturing a kind of order flow, right? Like what, what people type in the search bar, which is all their wants, hopes, desires. And like some of those orders are really valuable. Like I'm about to buy a house. I'm looking for a divorce lawyer. And some of those uh, uh, orders are, uh, those uh, search terms are much less valuable. Like, you know, how do I make this particular Python script work? How do I turn on my, you know, how do I restart my iPhone? Uh, these are, so, uh, and I think Web3 will be a, a very similar thing where, you know, if you are closer to, uh, you know, a user's decision about which main coin to buy, um, there's a lot more opportunities to extract value. And I think if you're uh, relatively far away from that, I think right now, you know, there has been a bunch of a network of like chain specific intermediaries that capture a lot of those values, like the Ethereum MEV supply chain. L2 sequencers, um, you know, RPC providers, all of those places have been uh, places where, you know, value is captured. Um, but if we build sort of chain abstracted apps, those apps actually are in a very pr privileged position, potentially uh, to create, capture, uh, share value with their users um, or that this, that like, you know, unfiltered, organic farm to table order flow creates. Yeah, I would add maybe that usually there's kind of a a, a smile curve of uh, value capture. So things that are closest to the user and things that are furthest from the user are the ones that capture value. And so the closest to the user is, like I said, right, the, the apps, the gateways, the super apps, the platforms um, that actually are uh, allowing user to interact, find, discover, uh, experiences and then the kind of lower stack is the you know the settlement the execution kind of the pieces that are 
you know, storing the value and kind of securing it and ensuring that it's uh, kind of consistent and and like moving moving the hardest kind of bits of the of the workflow. Um, and kind of the example in in you know Web two, it's been you know Facebook and Google on the user side, and you know Nvidia and uh, kind of other uh, like hardware and and uh, companies that are capturing a lot of the kind of heavyweight um, uh, part of the part of the value in Web two. Stefan, do you have any thoughts? Uh, no, not really. I'm I'm much more interested in the value that gets unlocked from having chain abstraction than the value that gets captured. Like for me, Web three never fulfilled its potential, and like I joined this space because I wanted global coordination mechanisms that made it easier for people to trust each other and innovate and like improve the future of humanity. Um, and I think what we have right now is global casino that makes it easier for people to speculate on shitcoins. And so I'm much more interested about how do we actually unlock the value and the promise of Web3 and blockchains than how do we actually split the, split the pie. Very fair. And, and I think we're, we're all in agreement with that. I just think it's interesting to, I think that the way that people extrapolate from today towards the, to, to the end game um, is actually very kind of, it, it, it assumes that a lot of the dynamics that we have today will be present in that end game. And I think um, chain abstraction is something that really changes a lot of like the base assumptions that you'd make. Um, and like, you know, <clears throat> Skip, uh, Barry, I saw Barry from Skip uh, the other day tweet something that was saying like, you know, day by day, it's becoming less important uh, where you build uh, as, as, as what you build. And I think that's a powerful way to kind of say that, um, yeah, like, you know, right now it's like, oh, well, what chain are you launching your DAP on? Because that's where liquidity and the users are and all, and all that. And I think in, in, in some point in the future, like users and liquidity will be so fluid across any chain. I mean, if, if chain abstraction is, is successful, that um, it, it will no longer really matter and, and kind of everything will be sort of like, like as Zaki once said, like, kind of like execution will be, or like state will be sort of commodified or very, yeah, very fluid. So anyway, I just find that interesting. Um, so uh, Stefan, I guess uh, what, you know, what is the value that you see getting created by chain abstraction and like would you say that it is sort of like the the, mo the most important thing to be working on at this moment in time like from from in terms of like helping crypto reach its full potential oh yeah well, for sure i can i can maybe think of like one other thing which is like how do you prevent like crypto from being taken over by the ai but let's just put that aside um and say that like this is the most exciting time to be working in Web3, by far, like no question asked. Because we have the block space scalability, we're able to launch all of these different application specific rollups, application specific change, blah, 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 and actually um, create applications that the users don't need to know that they're interfacing with a blockchain because it doesn't cost 200 bucks to be able to do anything. Um, and so, if we want that to be the case, if we want Web3 applications to be developed, we need to solve the user experience problem so that these amazing application developers with like great ideas of social things or gaming things or like all these different use cases that everyone's been shilling but no one's actually used um, can take place. Like we need to solve the, the, the chain of structure problem. So yeah, the most important problem, the most exciting time to be working in, in Web3. Yeah, I would second that. I think, I mean, as we were all starting, like trying to solve, like Nier started actually trying to use blockchain. We wanted to, you know, use it to pay people for work, for data crowdsourcing to trade AI. And the challenge we were facing was exactly this. is like the users needed to figure out how to install extensions and, you know, fund it from a centralized exchange 
to start earning, which is like the <laughs> the opposite is like, you know, you come to work and this, the first thing they ask you is to pay, uh, you know, so that they actually will, uh, will pay you the salary. So, but now we have the tooling, we have the infrastructure, we have, you know, meta transactions, we have the layers, we have kind of all the pieces that we need. And so now it's time, it's actually time, I think, to build the applications, because I think like a lot of the chain abstraction tooling is also here. And now it's more about working closely with applications to really deliver that, you know, and experience and, you know, fix whatever is not working in the tooling based on that feedback. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm inviting everyone to build applications and then, you know, come to us and like, we'll, we'll help fix whatever's not working to make sure that your experience it, and your user's experience is as smooth as humanly possible and better than Web2 in, because we can actually deliver, like we had applications that used Stripe, right? The Web2 payment processor and switched to Near because it's cheaper, because it's for microtransactions, actually blockchain can be cheaper than Web2 solutions. And so, uh, so payment solutions. And so, like we have now the value, we have now the infra. So, yeah, let's let's you know, I'm I'm encouraging everyone to build apps, and you know, let's let's bring the now even more users and even more experiences together to the Web three. So it also sounds though that like chain abstraction. Uh, kind of hinges on the, uh, I mean, the word abstraction itself, right, is about standards. Um, and I think in order to, you know, have a sort of like coordination layer that, you know, encompasses all these different chains and, and applications, there's going to be, you know, a, a need for, for standards basically to be established. And it kind of makes me think of, uh, and I know you, you're talking about this or, uh, sort of the beginning, Stefan, but um, you know, it makes me think about that uh, XKCD uh, comic where they're like, you know, situation, there are 14 competing standards. And then, you know, these two characters are like, oh, my God, there's 14 standards. We need to, like, you know, unify them. And then then the next frame is, oh, then now there are 15 competing standards. So how i mean i know that i guess that's the goal of, of, of cake is essentially to try to unify everything oh, but it, like, it just seems like I'll a very add one difficult oh, go ahead I'll, I'll add one meme layer you know that meme of like the minions with Gru, where it's like the infinite like replicating you know meme uh it's the same thing with chain abstraction you know we have all these now chain abstraction approaches. And the question is like, how do we abstract away all the chain abstraction approaches? And then how do we abstract away all the chain abstraction approaches that abstract away all the chain abstraction approaches that abstract the trains? And this is like an infinite rabbit hole that we can go down. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is a problem. Like the way that um, capitalism works and the way that like all the different teams that are working on these problems work is they have individual incentives based off of, you know, being a company, having their token, having their own community, their own like beliefs of the world and how this problem needs to be solved. And so the problem is a coordination problem. It's about getting all these people to agree and like use a single, uh, you know, definition of what we actually want to achieve and coordinate around using um, a single um, I, I sort of present it as as a, as a standard for for permissioning, uh, but really like a single um, a single framework. Um, and and the intent behind the Cake framework and the Cake working group is to provide the venue of conversation between all these different teams to coordinate around uh, something that is obviously going to be mutually beneficial for for everyone involved. Yeah, it's not an easy task. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think maybe to add here, right? I, I think, I mean, standardization is great, and you know, we all we all striving for that. I think the opportunity here is to create something that's the experience is so much better that people are just flocking to it, right? That's from my perspective, like as a product builder, the when you when we see actual experience that people are you know, holy shit, this is smooth, right? It, it solves my problems. Like that's that's when, you know, people just 
shared with friends, they, you know, everybody is piling in and you kind of see this explosion of usage, right? We had, we had this example with, you know, a wallet inside Telegram and it grew to like 4 million users in two months. And so kind of, we need to get to that level of experience and kind of applications that are truly uh, easy to use and onboard to, and they offer all of the flexibility that people want, right? We have another one, which is uh, DabDab, which allows to transact across 14 different layer twos uh, and, uh, you know, 150 different smart contracts, all in one application, all in one front end. You can see all your por portfolio across all 14 L2s. So those are examples, like, and again, they grew to 75,000 users. Um, like all of those examples are like, of something that you can present to a user and start seeing the growth and kind of, you can still see like, again, as I said, users will come back and tell you what doesn't work and we need to continue shipping improvements on all that. But now with applications, with truly chain abstract applications, we can have this feedback loop. And then through that, we can then, you know, feedback that to, to standardization and kind of work as a group of, you know, hey, how do we do standardization around intents? How do we do standardization around permissioning to make sure that uh, you know more and more participants can join and kind of uh, provide better user experience to this uh, end user products? That makes a ton of sense. And I don't know, I'm kind of getting the impression that um, while we all might believe in, in sort of like a, a a modular uh, <clears throat> sort of like chain future, it it sounds like chain abstraction leads to sort of like a, a monolithic super app interface to all these chains. Uh, do you think that's, that this kind of makes it like a winner take all dynamic um, for like whatever, whatever this like interface is that, that the users all kind of converge on? I guess would you I, would you consider JSON RPC API a monolithic super app? Definitely not. <laughs> I think it's the same thing. Yeah, I, the only thing I would all I would add on top of that, right, is there are always going to be like special properties to different chains, right? Like there will be chains that give you privacy. There will be chains that give you uh, um, that like. Uh, are better, you know, that have certain assets on it that don't exist in other chains. Uh, there will change, you know, change that where your bad kids live. Uh, it, this isn't about eliminating what makes every sovereign modular chain unique and special. But what it is is saying is that when you, you know, build something unique and special, you don't have to like boil the ocean, attract all of these uh, users to your one specific magical you know, new uh, like chain API in order to like actually show off what is unique and special about your chain. Ideally, it just comes down to you know, as an application builder, you have a set of APIs you have to impl you implement um, that sort of tell a bunch of super apps how to interface with your chain. Uh, and so, and now suddenly you just like you know, you pop up as a another option in the app store. Uh, and you know, as you market what is unique and special about your chain. Users are like, I can, with very low barrier to entry now, try that out, route liquidity from existing sources into that chain, uh, take advantage of whatever is unique and special and exciting about the, your blockchain. Stefan, did you want to elaborate more on the JSON RPC point? Uh, I think Zaki covered it well. Like... For this to win, it has to be an interface and not a product that gets distributed. And the interface needs to be expressive enough such that people can pick the product that they want to use behind it. And everyone will have their time in the light, right? Like everyone will have a fair shot at building the best component of the cake that is the most used. Um, and there will be winners and there will be losers. But as a whole, we only win if we are able to coordinate around a new interface. So not, not to bring things back to <clears throat> value capture, uh, that's, a, that's a dirty word, but um, 
it, it's you know something that Zucky mentioned sort of at the beginning of this was, um, you know, he he said we can have our cake and eat it too, but it depends on essentially like MEV, like the MEV tooling, or I can't remember specifically what you said, but you were saying something about MEV playing an important role and and whether or not these systems can can work and live up to their promise, and so I'm curious like what what that is because. Um, it sounds like a, a pretty important thing to consider when, when designing these things. If, if, if we don't, you know, I mean, MEV, it seems like it's something that's just totally inevitable and, and kind of like just inherent in blockchains. Um, and so if we don't solve that aspect of this, then, you know, maybe chain, chain abstraction won't actually unlock the value, right, that, that Stefan was talking about. Oh, I love like, this what, question. What do you mean I, by that? I, I want to dive deep on this with Zaki, actually. Like, what's the role of MEV in chain abstraction? I think that there's a bunch of different answers to that question, right? One is, you know, sort of cross-domain, cross-chain, like the fact that a user is originating some part of a value flow on one chain and uh, ending up with value flow on another chain uh, you know, this creates, so, you know, I think like one of the reasons why so many people who are working on chain abstraction have spent time working in the MEV space is what you discover in the MEV space is that there's uh, this giant workforce of very, very sophisticated economic actors that use blockchains in a way that no ordinary user ever would, Right that they, you know, are, you know, keeping track of the variation between on-chain prices and centralized exchange prices, you know, on the order of milliseconds, um, that they're picking, you know, helping pick, you know, what are the most profitable transactions to improve. Um, and so then the question is, you're like, oh, like these people exist. Well, okay, right now they're doing something that maybe not super value it, uh, you know, not create a lot of economic surplus for the ecosystem. But what if they could? What if, what if all of these sophisticated actors that are out there could actually be, you know, sort of lubricating the paths between different users? And so, like, you, you know, you then start saying, oh, like, what if we, what if instead of having a user interact with the bridge, they interact with an intense framework? And, the, and you know, a sophisticated actor uses the bridge to bridge liquidity under the hood, but the user doesn't have to agree with it. And you, you, you might get something that looks like a cross protocol. Um, what if, uh, uh, you know, what if instead of having to, you know, have a separate account on every other chain, you could originate your intents and there will be a network of relayers um, that, you know, broadcast your transaction and execute them on a variety of different chains and maybe pay for your gas because they're, they're capturing MEV along the way. Um, you know, they're capturing some value from that order flow. Um, you know, this, this is a question of, you know, it, it is this question that like, is like, can we recruit this network of, of, of super sophisticated users of blockchains into sort of value creating user assisting agents rather than pure value extractors? Hey, Amen. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I think the kind of transitioning away from people pretty much parasiting on kind of the order, f like because uh, they're like intercepting the transaction and transitioning more to the user tells that they want to achieve this action and somebody goes and figures out the most optimal way to do it and gets kind of a, a piece of that. I mean, that's that was the idea behind, for example, Robinhood. Right, which drops all the dropped all the trading fees for the end user because they figured out how to uh, pretty much kind of sell the order flow to uh, even more sophisticated actors on the other side, but offering like way better experience to the end user. And so I think like similar thing will start happening here, uh, where actually the fees for the user will go down because a more and more kind of sophisticated approaches will be developed and similar things like cow swap and other existing kind of intent based swaps right but you know you can expand that beyond just uh, pure uh, transactions yeah i remember <clears throat> a while ago 
uh, talking about an intense with with you, Zucky, and you were saying how intense can uh, turn toxic order flow into sort of like I don't know something something a lot more positive and incentive aligned and not not extractive, but actually um, you know yeah like like a, a positive thing for for the end user. And so I think there's a a lot of truth in that, um, and it makes me optimistic. I, I about... want to um... oh, go ahead. I want to ask the why, the how question. How so? I think there is this potential for um, intermediaries to add value to end users, but the kind of entire history of blockchain is to try to cut out these intermediaries that try to add value to users in TradFi. So the question is how? How is adding these intermediaries in Web three? going to be different than adding these intermediaries in Web2? Well, I think it, from my perspective, it's the, like in general, for me, Web3 is the ability to kind of switch between providers at any level of the stack without uh, much switching cost or ideally zero switching cost. Be that, you know, I can switch between RPCs, I can switch between wallets, you know, block produ you can switch between block producers. And so, Similarly here, you know, being able to switch between like who is your solver, who provides you with the kind of best execution flow compared to, you know, like traditionally you go to Charles Schwab, for example, and only Charles Schwab is executing your orders, right? And they can charge whatever they want, right? You don't actually like open it up to open market and then getting the best trade. Uh, so I think that's really the, like, you know, we're, we're moving away from this walled gardens, which are prevalent in traditional finance, where you need to interact with like a specific counterparty. Uh, they will, you know, KYC you, they'll enable you to transact. And then in turn, they can charge whatever the fee. And you don't want to go and like shop around in other tools because it's so complicated and cumbersome um, that there is no like market pressure as well. One of the are we really headed in a different direction though with Web three? I'm not so convinced. I have this. Okay, so one of the things that was so there was like a, a time in my life where I was selling blockchains to banks. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> it it got me to the it was a learning opportunity. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it finally got me to the to a conviction around why banks were never going to adopt blockchains and not in the way, not in the private blockchain ways that they did, you know, they might be forced into it by market forces. Uh, and, you know, if they were forced into it, it would be some version of interoperable with public chain infrastructure. But like, why is that? Um, you know, in, you know, the biggest source of power that all the intermediaries have in TradFi is that you can't see the system of record. And, and you know, that's also true in Web2, right? Like, you don't have, like, your email that exists in Gmail exists in this, you know, Google Spanner database that you have no ability to access the underlying data. Um, and, you know, if you own stock, you know, and, and it's sitting in your Fidelity account or your Schwab account, like, you don't have any independent access to that system of record. It's entirely... So, when, you know, when you have... A Fidelity account or a Schwab account, it opts you, you, you monolithically consume a whole bunch of other services associated with that around how orders are executed and traded. You know, you, you have to sort of go through that. They're, they're chosen things because you don't have access to the underlying system of record. And no one else, and you, you know, someone new has to, cannot easily spin up that. They have to kind of build everything from scratch, rebuild everything from scratch. And I do think that this concept uh, that cryptocurrency has of, you know, these open, publicly readable, publicly writable ledgers act as a pretty significant bulwark against enshrining any sort of intermediaries in the system. Yes, there will be periods of time when intermediaries become dominant, when, you know, someone is 10 or 100x better than everyone else in the market. Um, but your ability to sort of create huge barriers is actually a lot harder in web three. And I think that is, you know, fundamental and structural. Um, and I do think that is the reason why 
it's worth building these systems that sort of migrate people from TradFi to Web3. Legibility. Legibility yeah. of the legibility okay. gets you a lot. Yeah, legibility gets you a lot. Um, it is it is an incredibly powerful property. Do you think that remains as we shift to more and more orchestration off chain, like where the fulfillment is happening in these like other layers, where there's these dark pools with all the market makers that are fulfilling these intents and these RFQs? Do we keep legibility? Well, we should have more in like the intent order book should be on chain. That that allows to have a lot more legibility and a lot of competition, because yeah, if you keep it off chain, then whoever you know, whichever server you send it to now is able to pretty much front run it or you know censor it or do whatever they want with it. And so one thing I realize and come to to learn about these MEV systems is there's a fundamental tension between protecting the user and making the system legible. Um, so when we talk about protecting the system, the user, we talk about like front running protection, right? Like avoiding leaking data that the user creates uh, Two counterparties that have an asymmetric advantage in, in using that data. Um, but that sort of is a fundamental tension with making the system legible to anyone to be able to sort of audit and see what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I think like everything is solvable with enough, you know, cryptography and uh, kind of and, and desire to do that, right? It's, it's just the, the simpler solution, right? Like, hey, we'll just post the transactions into a share at B2B network and it's going to be fine. That is, uh, you know, where like, yes, now it's it's easy to front run it, right? Then. You can have okay. Well, well, we'll encrypt the transaction, and then you need to have a group to decrypt it. And now you already have predetermined order. Or you can have other post conditions, but like you, you need to do more work, pretty much, and add extra complexity to have some of this user protecting privacy and uh, kind of protections. And I think the ch the challenge is is uh, like it requires extra work. It requires extra maintenance, and so like it needs to be worth it, right? And I think early on in the blockchain space, it just wasn't worth it. Uh, as we're getting more and more kind of economy shifted, you know, into this, I think it will become pretty fundamental that we need to roll all of this out. Do we have that magic cryptography stuff already? Yeah, I mean, you can have threshold signatures to decrypt, for example, uh trans like encrypted mempool transactions uh you can have you can have the delay function where the sequencer commits to uh to order before they can start uh pretty much on like unrolling the uh the time lock you can have zk for privacy for example you only post that uh you're gonna pay tr the transaction fee to the relayer and then but the relayer doesn't know who you are and just relays your transactions on other chains so there's a disconnect between your core root account and your kind of remote accounts through chain signatures so you, you like we can have all of this kind of pieces added it's just like they're not the default right now um and so the kind of it's important for us to start thinking about it and adding and rolling this out, but I agree with you that like there is a general, you know, let's just let's just get something out that's legible, or let's you know roll something out that's controlled by a single party, which is always a better experience in the beginning than decentralized option. Uh, and so, so there there is like a kind of like a hill you need to climb from both sides, right? That's like. A decentralized, legible, but not user protecting, and there is a centralized user protecting, but then ends up being not legible. And so, climbing the hill is really important. Makes sense. So we've covered a lot um, already. Um, I'm curious if you guys have any sort of like 
big picture takeaways or any topics that you wanted to touch on before we uh, start to sort of close things up? Well, I mean, just to, as a minute of shell, right? We rolled out change signatures. <laughs> yeah. It's it's developer ready, so we invite, as I mentioned, we invite everyone to start building applications that are chain abstracted. You know, you can have one account that kind of transacts across all chains, and uh, the benefit is we can kind of bring a you know a bunch of users across all of the core near applications to start interacting with that. And so I'm really excited to see more real apps launching that are able to uh, work across different chains and being able to benefit from you know all of this block space and technology that's been built, and then in turn, uh, you know, bringing more and more users who are not limited by you know any single blockchain, right? Not limiting the application's target audience as well in in return. So if you're a builder. You know, you know where to find us. So I actually had a question about that product, Ilya, which is um, so the way I understand it is that it's sort of like there's a committee that holds all the the shards of of your uh, account essentially, and there's like an MPC process that they carry out to sign transactions on your behalf on other chains. But then if they I mean, essentially, it's sort of like they they uh, that committee or valid validator set has sort of like custody of your funds, more or less. So, is there there's sort of like an economic there's like a threshold of how much funds can safely be like custodied by that committee? Is that the right way to think about it, or is there like a different security model? Yeah, yeah, no, that's the right way to think about it. And uh, yeah, there's a threshold. Um... So the, I mean, it starts right now with a smaller committee, uh, but the idea is to scale this committee to the whole near validator set. And also we're already partnering with EigenLayer to include some of the uh, kind of Ethereum validators who are restaking as well to include in the set. So the idea is to have kind of, you know, near staking security and, you know, part of Ethereum stake security and, you know, wh whoever else we can ramp into this to, continue increasing the maximum kind of economic security of this of the system. Okay, very cool. Nice. Yeah. I'd so love how, to, how does... to riff on okay. this more. Go ahead. Yeah. Go for it, Stefan. What, um, maybe there's a question for both, both Zaki and Ilya. Uh, I'd love to hear Zaki's take on this. What properties does a universal permissioning um, system, like policy system, that's compatible with accounts across multiple different sort of semantic environments need to have. How do we actually get to this icing on the cake? On the cake, what does that, you know, what are the requirements for it? I mean, I can start so, from my. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Everybody's polite. Um, I, I mean, from my perspective, like it's really important to have the account kind of level system that allows you to manage your account effectively. So because like whatever permissioning you're allowed to do, like if you cannot secure your account, you cannot have kind of um, like ideally better security than Web2, right? And Web2 has very standard, like second factor, it has very standard, like active transaction monitoring and other uh, kind of standard security features. Like we need that. And then from there, I think there will be a need a lot as well as you delegate kind of the various, like, you know, if you're using some of the, if you're using some other agents that are doing things on your behalf, like how to guarantee security there, how to ensure that. And again, this is from perspective of wallets or apps that are actually using this, right? Because use, at the end user will not be able to like manually inspect how all of this working. So it's more, how does wallet ensure that everything is coherent and working and, uh, you know, make sure that account is secure, make sure that user is not, you know, being, uh, kind of interfacing with a fake application, fake front end, fake something. Right. So there's a lot of components that needs to go into this to really provide kind of heightened security level while not hindering the user experience. So I think there's a, 
couple of elements that I think a lot about here. One is, so interoperability sort of rears its head again um, in these places, right? You know, having a really, really secure account management system, but having insecure ways for that account management system to then reach out uh, and interoperate with, you know, where you want, you know, transactions to be executed, value to be settled, all of those things. Um, it's not really, it, you know, it, 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 we can, we're in a state where we can make, I think we, we can be like in the early days of account of chain abstraction, we can, we can cast a wide net about, you know, what interoperability systems are acceptable. Um, I do think, uh, you know, it, we are still in the very much in that rapid prototyping state and like, but in the long run, I want to see, I want you, you want, you know, there's a lot of power to converging more and more interop to, around zero knowledge um, and, you know, white clients and like, you know, other sorts of like very robust sort of uh, storage proofs, um, very robust systems. I think also this idea, you know, that comes, um, comes from, you know, our friends at Agoric about, you know, being able to have like convenient ways of dealing with asynchrony um, are also a big part of the, the API that we are going to need to provide for developers, right? You know, the, you know, in the non-account abstracted world or in the non-chain abstracted world, sure, you might have uh, sort of synchronous execution with one chain, uh, but it is really, really nice to be able to just sign one, you know, to, to click one button or sign one transaction and have a whole asynchronous uh, sequence of events, um, uh, you know, happen where, you know, you, uh, swap an app, you know, you swap an asset, uh, you know, the asset gets staked, the asset gets bridged, all of these things happen, um, with relatively small numbers of user interactions. Um, and so I do, I do think like asynchrony is also going to be a big part of, uh, of making, of making this sort of chain abstracted world come together. Cause right now, you know, in the non chain abstracted world, what we do is we force the user to handle the asynchrony. You know, we'll, we'll give them a tab that'll like, you know, send them a notification that it now, you know, that like, you know, part two of your swap is now ready to go. Uh, while you like, you know, you know, go back to, you know, browsing Instagram uh, while you wait. Uh, but that's like not really going to work. Like we do, we need to be able to, like users need to be able to confidently say, hey, I signed this thing. Maybe it will take some time to be executed securely. Um, but and you know, but either you know the I will get the price that I expected, I will get the assets that I expected, or like you know, my money will end up in some sane place, um, uh, and I don't have to like monitor every step uh, along the way. Uh, it does, you know, sometimes cross chain uh, interactions, like you know, you know, you you're like, oh, I need to like move my ETH from uh, optimism to arbitrum. You know, it's like, oh, I will now wait a week and then remember to come back, then move my eighth uh, to the Arbitrum Bridge. Uh, that's kind of a ridiculous idea, even if people wanted to, if, if that ends up being, you know, people aren't going to use some sort of intent-based system to move that, do those moves. Like, we need to be able to be able to, like, say, you no, know, like, you started this process and now this agent will just, you know, keep moving the process along until you get to your destination. When, um, when you talk about... Um, safety or like security here, you mean, well, let me just say what I understood by it. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what I understood by it is basically having in this asynchronous environment with multiple execution uh, zones that have various different trust assumptions, you want to be able to essentially have a bundle of transactions that executes on multiple chains in a certain order and have atomicity guarantees across this bundle such that individual transactions are all fill or kill together with the, the bundle as a whole. Um, so either you execute all or you don't execute any. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that I would sort of call bundle safety. Um, is that what you have in mind? I don't know. I, like bundle safety is certainly a nice property. It's a it's a it's a hard property to guarantee under all possible circumstances. Um, it's generally like what I think we want the, these systems to be able to guarantee on like in the common case, uh, and then like in the in the failure mode, you know, you want to like you want your money to end up back in stables or something like that. 
Um, you know, if you and like mm-hmm. on a chain that you recognize rather than, you know, in some random corner some of Web3. Yeah. yeah, in some random corner of Web3 and some asset that you've never heard of before. Um, and that does that does require a very powerful and expressive system. Interesting. Um, are permissions sort of in this model, do they need to be sort of arbitrary programs that like the applications have to sort of come up with? Or can it be sort of, um, yeah, can it be some subset of, of just arbitrary programming? But I mean, arbitrary programs allow you to, you know, specify anything you want. So like, I don't, I don't think you gain much from having a subset. I mean, simplicity perhaps. Uh, and less bugs, these kinds of things. <laughs> well, we need we need to get better at uh, building verifiable software. We'll have AI helping us with that. So <laughs> okay. good, so yeah. good. <laughs> um, okay. Well, guys, we're we're coming up on the the end of our uh, hour and a half here. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys have any. Um, I don't know, takeaways or, um, I don't know, big picture uh, thoughts that you wanted to uh, end end with uh, for, for the audience. Build apps. What you build is more important than where you build it. I think that, that you, <laughs> as you mentioned it, that's, that's probably the main, main idea here. That's a good tagline. Zaki, you have anything? I'm happy to close it off. Uh Oh, maybe Zaki's running into his speaker problem again. (laughs) Uh, I think the way I'll close it off is um, if we want to have our cake and eat it too, we need to um, figure out what the icing on the cake is. We need to figure out what flavor it is. (laughs) And uh, once we do that, then, uh, then we can actually progress. Yeah, I would. I will just. I think that there's a big opportunity um, to build some new user experiences with these chain abstraction tools um, that can be that will be you know very exciting and compelling. You know, I do think that like you know there there is the there, the moment of the chain abstracted meme coin uh, is coming. Uh, you know, I'm not <laughs> entirely bearish on the meme coin casino. I just I just want the meme coin casinos uh, to be used to build things that like will matter in the long run, um, and so I, I do I do think that this you know I do think that like we are, we're you know there will be there's this is a good time to get some MVP applications out uh, out and try and attract users and try and give them an experience that they haven't had before. So the first breakout uh, use case of chain abstraction is going to be. A chain abstracted meme coin. Do I have you on record saying that now, Zeki? Absolutely. <laughs> what else could it be? <laughs> Someone's going to do it then. So, um, Stefan, if people wanted to get involved in, you know, helping with the icing on the cake, um, where, you know, how do they get involved? Like, what's what's the what 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 is the the cake committee uh doing and um what, when's the next sort of like i don't know conversation yeah great question so uh cake working group um the best way to join is go to frontier.tech and there's this section that says contribute and then we have sort of the cake working group manifesto and all the members and then the application form to join um, we organize sort of recurring uh, workshops, meeting. I think right now we're about about uh, once a month, but we might increase the frequency. And we're driving towards um, proposing some of these standards um, and more importantly, reflecting all the requirements that the various teams have so that we can have some common language to speak about the, um, the components of, of the cake. Um, and so anyone who's building anything that uses the JSON RPC API should consider joining. 
because that's the that's the beast that we're trying to to wrestle with. Great, awesome. Well, uh, thank you guys all for for joining and um, for a really interesting uh, discussion about chain abstraction. And um, I think there's going to be a lot to to follow in this space. And I, I would agree that I think now that it feels that so many of the infrastructure problems are not solved, but the solutions are at least known, um, this this problem of chain abstraction is becoming quickly becoming the most interesting and important. Uh, area of, of research and development. So um, really glad that we could uh, have you guys on to share everything, all your thoughts, and i um, looking forward to following what all gets built. So thanks again. Thank you. See you. Thanks.